I should be coming back live and getting here soon. see me hear me we're uh, we're trying to do this live again hopefully hopefully it's all working is everybody is everybody back with us yes. okay I apologize again for the technical uh, difficulties uh, there uh, as I think we left off uh, in the, uh, the live feed there, uh, we were talking about the disciples' fear of the, the Jewish leaders, how they had locked themselves into this uh, room uh, because they were afraid uh, of those who had um, done these things to Jesus. And they were afraid that uh, they were going to do the same thing to them uh, as well. Uh, and it was a very, very real uh, fear that they had. It was a fear that had driven them into the darkness for many of them the few days before as they had scattered during Jesus' arrest. It was fear that had uh, led Peter to deny Jesus three times. And, uh, and even now, after those uh, around them had borne witness to the resurrection of Jesus, here they were in fear, locked in this room. Uh, hiding, huddled together, unable to live in freedom because of this fear that they have. But then something strange happens, and the next sentence tells of this thing. Uh, Jesus came, and he stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Jesus comes to them in a locked room. <laughs> and no one knows quite how Jesus got there, but but somehow he appears to them behind these locked doors and the locked doors of their fear. And he greets them with what was the customary Jewish greeting of the day. Peace be with you. That word peace that Jesus would have said was the Hebrew word shalom. And for the Jewish people, that was, that was more than just a greeting. Shalom was a connection to their past. Shalom was a connection to their roots, to their identity as God's chosen people. Shalom, peace for the people, was, was always tied to a sense of God's presence with them. Peace came from knowing that God was their God and they were his people and that he would be with them as their rock, as their shepherd, as their provider and their protector, no matter what happened, no matter what the world might throw against them, what trials they might endure, they would be able to endure these trials. They would be able to persevere through the difficult times and they would be able to emerge victorious because God was their shalom. He was their peace. And Jesus had spoken often of this peace that comes from God, especially in the week leading up to his death. He, he told them how he himself would not only give them peace, but he would be their peace, their shalom. And so when Jesus shows up behind these fear-locked doors of the disciples in the middle of their chaos, and he says, peace, shalom be with you. It is so much more than just a customary greeting. It is the fulfillment of their deepest hopes and dreams. It is an answer to all of their doubts and all of their fears. Although the funny thing is, in the Gospel of Luke, as Luke is telling the story, he says that even after Jesus appears in their midst and greets them with peace, that doesn't put an end to their fear. In fact, if anything, it adds to it. In Luke's account, the disciples think that Jesus is a ghost. That, that this is not the risen, resurrected Jesus. This is the tormented soul of Jesus visiting them from the realm of the dead. And they're terrified. But then Jesus does three things that immediately calms their fears and chases away the darkness of their doubts. Three things that bring them his peace. The first thing he does, he proves the reality of his resurrection. Scriptures say that after uh, he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. 
Jesus shows them that indeed he is not a ghost. He is not some tormented spirit sent to haunt or warn them, but that he is alive. He is truly and really alive. That his body is a real body made of flesh and blood and so much more than that. It is his body. That it still bears the marks, the scars as evidence that he died a real death, but also as proof of his triumph over death. And the Bible says they were overjoyed. Why? Because they saw him. You know, just moments before, they had seen him with their eyes, and they were still filled with fear when he appeared in their midst and spoke these words of peace. They, they saw him, but they didn't really see him for who he was. But when he shows them the wounds, the eyes of their hearts are opened, and they recognize him for who he is. They experience this joy that though once he was dead, now he is alive, and he is with them. He's, he's with them. That, that, that not only are these unbelievable reports actually true, but that it is true for them that he is alive and he is present with them. That's, that's the first thing that Jesus does to bring shalom, the peace of God. He makes himself present to them in their hour of need, and they rejoice that he is with them. And then Jesus does a second thing. He says, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We'll come back to that commissioning. But then he does this. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We'll take a look at that first part. I want to focus on the second part. Jesus breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Again, just as Jesus had often spoken of peace in the days leading up to his trial and his death, he'd also spoken often about the Holy Spirit. In fact, he had often put these two realities, the peace of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit, together. That this otherworldly peace of God would only be made possible through the presence of this Holy Spirit. In fact, he had told them that it would be better if he left them, because then he would send the Spirit to them, and the Spirit would make his home in them, and the Spirit would be their teacher and their guide and their counselor and their comforter. That the Spirit would be... God's peace in whatever they might face. And here he is fulfilling that promise by breathing his Holy Spirit into them. It's an act that recalls the original creation of, of humanity as told in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 where God forms man out of the dust and the mud of the earth and he breathes life into him. That Hebrew word in Genesis for breath is the word ruach which means both breath as well as spirit. That God brought the original man to life with the breath of the spirit. And here Jesus is recreating anew this, this reality by breathing the new life of the Holy Spirit in his disciples so, so that they can live as new creations, not according to the fallen flesh, but according to the life-giving spirit, the spirit of peace. And not just peace, but also power for accomplishing God's purpose. And that's the third source of peace that Christ presents to his disciples. In verse 23, he gives them this commission. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, these are, these are words that have often been misunderstood and misapplied throughout Christian history and theology. But when you put them into the proper context of the life and the ministry and the mission uh, of the man who is speaking them, of Jesus Christ himself, they make perfect sense, though it doesn't make them any less challenging. See, sin, according to Jesus, is primarily uh, humanity's rejection of and rebellion against God's revelation of himself. That, that where there, that was the original uh, sin of Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden where they, where they questioned God's goodness and rebelled against the one thing that God had told them not to do. Whether that's the history of, of Israel's rebellion against God's laws that were given to them through the Ten Commandments and the other instructions that he had given through Moses. 
whether that was their rejection of the prophets who God had sent repeatedly to, to win them back to his will and to his way, whether that was their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, as the Deliverer sent to reveal God in the flesh and lead them into a new kind of life, whether that is our own rejection of and rebellion against God, that wherever Jesus makes himself known to us and leads us into the righteous life that God has intended for us and we choose to go our own way. All sin is a rejection of and rebellion against the revealed person of God. And when that happens, when we reject God and we rebel against him, the natural outcome of that is that we become separated from God. We become removed from his blessings of light and of life and of love. And the result of that separation from God is condemnation. Life without God is life that is against God. But Jesus came into this world, the scriptures say, not to condemn the world, but to save it. Through his death and through his resurrection, he broke down that barrier, that wall of separation between God and humanity, and he made peace possible through his sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of sin. And whatever else might be being said in these verses, this much is true, that forgiveness can only come through believing in Jesus, not through the words or the works of any human being. You and I do not have the power to forgive sin. Only Christ can do that. But what we can do, and what I think Jesus is telling his disciples here, is we can share the message that forgiveness is possible through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is commissioning his disciples to do here. That is the sacred responsibility that he is passing on to them. That is the mission that he is sending them on, that just as he was sent from the Father to, to purchase forgiveness, through, through his blood shed on the cross. So we are being sent by Jesus to share that message of good news with others so that they also can be forgiven. And with that commission from Christ to carry this message comes a choice. Will we therefore go and proclaim and make this message of forgiveness of peace known to the world, or are we going to keep it to ourselves and let the world perish in ignorance of the good news of Jesus Christ? Will we bring the peace of God that we ourselves have experienced, or are we going to withhold it? See, we, we live in a world that's at war. We live in a world that is filled with fear. And it's easy for us to get caught up in that fear. On Easter morning, we awake to the victory of Christ. But often by Easter night, we are right back where we started, fighting and filled with fear. But Christ comes to us in the darkness of that doubt, in the darkness of that fear, in those places where we are trying to keep the doors locked, to keep the monsters out, and he speaks to us peace. Peace that comes only from being in the presence of the resurrected Jesus, whose hands and whose feet bear the marks of the very things that we fear the most. But by his wounds, we are healed. He knows your fear. He's not a stranger to our fear. He's faced it himself, and he can conquer our fears, and he can bring light into the darkest places of our lives. So when you are afraid, run to him. His arms and experience his peace. He, he speaks peace to us that comes from experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. See, apart from uh, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing to overcome our fear. We will always be captive to fear. But when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, when we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can step out in faith and we can step out in courage and we can face our fears and our failures and we can experience Christ's triumph over them. And his peace comes as we do the work 
to which Jesus has called each and every one of us as his disciples, that in receiving his peace, we offer it to others. As partakers of his grace, we freely give it away. As those who have been forgiven, we share that forgiveness with the world so that they too can know the peace of God. Peace that only comes by being in the presence of the risen Christ. Peace that only comes by receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit. Peace that only comes by doing the work to which the, the Father has called us. Peace that comes as we are in the presence of the Prince of Peace as we receive the promise of the spirit of peace, and as we do the work of bringing God's peace to the world. And as we do these three things in these three ways, the peace of Christ is made known to us and to others. And my prayer is that it would be made known to us today, and it would be made known in us today, and it would be made known through us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You are our peace. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, you broke down the wall of separation that divided us from you. And you can break down the walls of separation that divide us from each other. It's a miracle that only you can do, God. And so we uh, receive the peace that you have freely offered to us through your sacrifice on the cross, through your victory over the fears that we have. receive that peace from you. And I pray that as we receive that peace, the peace of forgiveness, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we would then go forth into this world that is filled with fear, with the presence of your peace. That we might be your shalom bringers. And that the world may know you and be free.
peace of God is always connected to the presence of God. So as much as we might be distracted away from seeking after him and running to him and instead get our eyes distracted by all these other things going on around us, my encouragement and my challenge to you and to myself is that we, as we experience these fears in our world today, that we would seek after his presence and that in his presence we would find his peace. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever.